Good afternoon to you all, and thank you for coming. I'm really delighted to talk today, so thank you again, Professor James Green, Ramon, uh, and the Brazil Initiative for this invitation and for all the support to Brazil and to Brazilians in these challenging times. Thank you also, Professors Leila and Jeremy Lennon for, from Portuguese and Brazilian Studies Department, and Professor Erika Durante from CLAX. Thank you also to João Guilherme Granja, a Brazilian researcher research with whom I have several works published and who happens to be my husband. And finally, thank you to FAPDF, the Research Foundation of Federal District in Brazil, for funding this research. I'll be presenting this work in a modest spirit of needing feedback today, so if by any chance you have comments, it will be very welcome. I'm going to read this paper, but I think and I hope it's quite clear. I will start my talking saying fora Bolsonaro, <laughs> say no to Bolsonaro, because what I'm going to talk about today is in the same horizon of resistance. This is an academic research with a political agenda, focusing on social change and the reconfiguration of the Brazilian food policy. This talk is organized in two parts. First, I will discuss the culinary thinking as a methodological device. Second, I will reflect upon food production and food policies in Brazil, its relationship with public health, the protection of environment, and Brazilian land policy. The dimension of affection encompasses both parts as an element that introduces different frames of citizenship, work relations, and ways of producing, con distributing, and consuming food. I take the French notion of terroir to think about local food production, especially by traditional communities, such as indigenous and quilombolas, as well as small family farmers and landless workers, workers' settlements, as a heritage and as an asset. I take analytical categories that could be employed in comparative approaches or other specific contexts that is characterized by looking into the connections between symbolic and material aspects of consumption and production relations as an integrated epistemological object following previous works in my research agenda. And here I am focusing on Brazil and on, and on a Brazilian specific ecosystem, the Cerrado. So this is the map and this is the Cerrado biome in brown. Um, this biome is important for many reasons. It is in the heart of Brazilian territory. It is spread across all geographical regions in Brazil. It is today one of the most important agricultural expansion frontiers in the country. And although the importance of the Amazon region, the Cerrado has the highest rates of deforestation in Brazil. Uh, for a long time, the Cerrado was seen as an empty space, a scar in the territory, an empty space between the Atlantic forest, uh, the Mata Atlantica, and the Amazon. So this is a quotation from a Brazilian writer, Nicholas Baer, explaining how the Cerrado was seen like an empty space because people look to the soy plantations and think, oh, it's green. And the Cerrado, most, of the par most parts of the year are very dry. Sometimes it looks like a desert. Uh, sometimes the Cerrado word is translated as savanna, but I prefer to keep the Cerrado meaning because it's quite different. So I will continue to talk about Brazil, but before I want to present a theoretical comprehension about food that is foundational to my explanation about food policies that have been affecting food production and consumption in Brazil. This is a relatively recent research project, but I see it connected to the research agenda that I have been developing for a long time about the field of fashion inscribed in the field of consumption and material cultural studies. There is a vast literature that allowed us to build bridges and connections between research fields. To establish the connection between these two axes, fashion and food, I refer here to Levi-Strauss and his understanding that dressing and cooking are the processes that make the transition from nature to culture. So Levi-Strauss tells us about the cooking processes, about the discovery of fire that allows the cooking of food. 
which allows the modification of raw food to cook it as a change from, from a biological condition to a social condition. So fire introduces this element of sociability, of sharing meals, both the sharing of food and also other symbolic exchanges surround this moment. In this context, what is biological changes? The biological is reconstituted in a symbolic body. Cooking is recurrently an image of the transformative power of culture. It gathers symbols. Besides food, pottery and utensils are baked as well, all the surroundings of the mealtime. The understanding of this transformative power of fire in cooking is central to elaborate an analytical perspective on the relationships developed around food. This is what we call commensality, which can be understood as the social function of meals, so that cooking favored social interactions. The word commensality, in Portuguese, comensalidade, derives from the Latin mensa, which means mingle at the table. This conviviality not only marks a dietary pattern of what we eat, but mainly how we eat. The table emerges then as a space of sociability, and eating emerges as a structuring factor of social organization. The food and the surroundings rituals are mediators in social dealings, and the table often has a peaceful, diplomatic function. Ceremonial and protocol dinner, diners have, for example, played strategic roles for centuries and even today. This relates to the distribution of seats, who sits close to home, who sits close to the host or hostess, what kind of food should and should not be served for certain guests, the order in which different foods should be served, the presentation, whether they are eaten together or separately. Commensality plays an important role in social balance, and eating reveals a great deal about the structure of our daily lives. A discussion that organizes well the understanding of what we eat was made by Marshall Salins in his work Culture and Practical Reason. Salins problematizes the consumption of meat by Americans, and for him, subjects do not simply survive, but we do so in specific ways, culturally defined. The refusal to consume meat, the meat of certain animals, for example, is anchored in culture and not in the economic rationality or nutritional value of food. This explains, for instance, why Americans described in Salin's work do not accept eating dog meat in such a way, although Chinese people do not have problem. And Salin's controversially states that America is the land of the holy dog, drawing an analogy with India, where the cow is a sacred animal. Salins argues that there is no practical reason that justifies his, this decision but culture. Where dog is our best friend, it's unacceptable to eat them. This ban may lead us to classify it as a taboo. For a discussion on how we eat, I turn to Norbert Elias, who discusses in his work, The Civilizing Process, how the ritualization of meals and a certain arrangement or embodiment in the use of devices such as the fork and the knife, for example, organize the form of how to behave at the table. Over time, the use of these accessories becomes good manners. Knowing how to use them within the rules of etiquette makes these manners perceived as elements of social distinction, and this illustrates the civilizing process in the West. This process even organizes a system of taboos to ensure that violence stays away from the table, because forks and knives could be converted into weapons. Elias also introduces emotion as an important element in contextualizing a historical perspective on table sociability by reporting medieval customs. He says that people who were together in the way customary in the Middle Ages, they usually to take meat with their fingers from the same dish, wine from the same goblet, soup from the same bowl, and such people stood in a different relationship to one another than we do today. Their affects were conditioned to forms of relationship and conduct which by today's standards are embarrassing or at least unattractive. 
This historical anthropological perspective is fundamental for reflection of culinary thinking as a methodological device. Ancient chroniclers, such as Plutarch, say that we do not sit at the table only to eat, but to eat together, highlighting the vital role of food in building and strengthening family and social bonds. The ritualization of meals and the establishment of rules about what we eat, especially through the attribution of meanings about what is apt to enter the food process, therefore the cultural process, about what is pure, about what is unclean and profane, it has a religious origin, and the Judeo-Christian tradition is very representative of it. There is a symbolism that even positions the experience of eating as a form of knowledge, and which is foundational to the Judeo-Christian tradition, eating the fruit that was not meant for, meant for those people. Curiously, the punishment for touching the fru forbidden fruit would be to have to work to produce and prepare their own food. Within the path that organizes the reflective horizon of this talk, I also introduce the reflection on food as affection. The image of affection is often evoked from a genealogical perspective, which brings the close relationship between care and nutrition. For example, the uterine affectivity mirrored in maternal feeding. Also, the etymological and social origin of the word restaurant, which express a relationship. Already noted in the Platonic discourses in ancient Greece between food, space, and the means of restoration by food. This association is present in notions such as affective food, much studied in the field of tourism and hospitality, which extracts this restorative meaning from food, where restoration occurs through the effect of food, which affects the subjects. This expands conceptual connections beyond the individual dimension and beyond the private world. Food affects, produces affection. One of its effects is feeling welcome. We feel welcome through food. Linked to these meanings, but also introducing other elements, what I am presenting is an attempt to think about cuisine or cooking or culinary as a methodology. To think of the experience of eating, of preparing, of witnessing, as a specific ethnography of the production of affects, which is also allowing oneself to be affected to be affected by the atmosphere that often runs through all the stages of food chain, from production to distribution to consumption. This proposal is constructed in a dialogical manner inspired by the work of the French ethnographer Jean Favre Sada. To be affected is to be transformed, and this transformation has much to do with the chemical transformation, but also alchemical transformation in the sense of a symbolic transmutation of food as products, of things, of the surroundings of food, of people through sociability. The movie Babette's Feast is an iconic portrayal of this relationship between food and affections. For those who haven't watched it, the film is set in Denmark in the second half of the 19th century, century, in a village where religion is the center of social life. The daily lives of the few residents are marked by Puritanism, by an austerity of lifestyles, including dressing, eating, and socializing. The arrival of the French refugee Babette, employed by two daughters of the late reverend for whom Babette begins to work as a cook, slightly alters this balance organized by austerity. This change occurs through the introduction of new sensations of pleasure and diversification in eating, Previously, the food base seemed to be bread, fish, and beer. At some point, Babette receives the news that she has won in the lottery, and she offers a feast for the sisters who employed her and other villagers. What I want to highlight is the experience of the meal and the, man the manifestation of affection during the feast, with the initial resistance of the participants, the shame of eating and drinking, 
and how it changes over dinner as one of the guests, who is a connoisseur, explains the symbolic meaning of what is being eaten and drunk. Babette introduces a world to those people through her cooking, and this is transformative of the role of food and its preparation. This is heuristic even to think about how cognition and knowledge organization systems have been structured in the West and suggests many aspects for discussion. The role of manual labor, the role of the feminine, religion, the relations between the domestic and the public as separate universes, the local and the global, and the possible cosmopolitanisms. These separations are all broken by the repositioning of the food that is represented at Babette's feast, which finds a contemporary correspondent in the various media programs dedicated to linking travel, adventure, and the exploration of the unknown by food. On a local scale, I want to present to you something from my fieldwork. In Brasilia, there is a Babette's feast, which is reenacted by a Danish chef based in the Cerrado region. Once a year, he organizes this dinner, which takes place after the film is screened for mostly upper middle class people at his residence in the North Lake region. Curiously, in the other dinners he cooks, the ingredients of the Brazilian Cerrado are always protagonists, and he's, he has almost become an ambassador of local products in the Cerrado. At the same time, he stands as this cook who presents an European cultural cinematic erudite world to those di dinners with the reenactment of Babette's feast, but also presents himself as a mediator of the local production, the Pequi, the Cajuzinho of Cerrado, Vanilla do Cerrado, local cheeses, and a wide range of other local products representing what would be familiar, but which is symbolically recontextualized at these diners as something special. This connection between cultures can take many forms, also revealing different asymmetries of power and the circulation of values in a world scale. In the culinary field, these asymmetries are revealed in the growing contrasts between local cuisines, sometimes called typical, ethnic, or what otherwise structured under the sign of geographical location or cultural identity, and large-scale culinary production, which is massified and standardized. This cuisine that emerges as a manifestation of local identity needs both the circulation of inputs and the people through which traditional techniques and processes, at least in their places of origin, can be perpetuated. They are often related to migratory presences, diaspora's consolidation, and international circuits of post-colonial relations. This cuisine needs to be in contact with the experience of the original place whether it is a concrete experience or a symbolic evocation. This experience is of the order of affection, memory, welcoming, a series of emotions whose political economy will try to equate the various motivators of displacement, migration, diaspora, approaching their present context. In contrast, the globalized food industry, integrated with international circuits of production, distribution, and consumption, need to operate in scale, homogeneity, and strategic alignment under marketing and logistics management guidelines. While they are responsible for feeding billions of people in the world, economies of scale structure, economies of scale structure a distinct universe of social relations. Large-scale production becomes detached from the traditional means, techniques, and relations of production. Rather than subjecting themselves to the seasonality and eventuality of meteorology and geography, they demand subjugation of these dynamics, adaptation and genetic improvement, pest control, soil adaptation, and standardization of production relations at all levels. The characteristics that make local production idiosyncratic and unique simply do not survive on the scale of global production. 
while competing for the same resources, circuits of economic exchange and global circulation are not fueled entirely by the conflict of such models. On the contrary, the possibility of changing the experience of the place, the memory and the local of being affected becomes a valuable asset and incorporates narratives accessible by consumption. Consumption globalism offers the experience of the place of agrotourism, agroturism in Portuguese, visiting traditional farms, gastronomic culture, among others, as a possibility of a cosmopolitan knowledge structured as a luxury asset based on frugality, on the escape from the massive centers of consumption. So continuing with the specific focus of this research so that we can address possible questions, another important part of this work is the discussion about different models of food production, in particular about the place. For that, I recur to the French notion of terroir to discuss the relationship between nature and culture in creating meanings about what we eat, how we eat, how we produce and distribute. Terroir refers to the relationship between the land and the quality of the wine produced by this land. It encompasses the relationship between soil, climate and topography and how it impacts on the taste of the grapes and hence the wine itself, how it builds the reputation of the wine, but also the reputation of the producer and his family network involved in the production, their immediate collaborators, the reputation of the winery itself, and often the reputation of the entire geographical region where the wine is produced. But there are other intangible aspects in this production, which also constitute a terroir. That is people's connection to the place of production, the land, local traditions, and specific modes and technologies of production. It is the relationship between culture cultivated as agriculture and culture as language and identity. So the fieldwork part of this research is located between the country and the urban spaces in the city. I reflect upon the Cerrado Terroir, thinking about how this Cerrado biome is produced, communicated and diffused in the urban spaces of consumption. So who grows in the Cerrado bioma? Traditional method, who develops traditional methods and know-how? Know uh, some family farming, family farming of Quilombola communities, indigenous people, migrants, also among other social actors dedicated to local production is the movement of <coughs> landless workers, MST, settlements and small producers, sometimes former members of MST movement which is today one of the most important producers of food for internal consumption in Brazil and relevant exporting actors. Uh, the products with the uh, designation of origin are some organic vegetables, local cheeses, wine from the Cocalzinho region in the Cerrado close to Brasilia, uh, the Cerrado's small wild cashew, this one which is cajuzinho do Cerrado, the pequi, that yellow one, coffee of the Cerrado, vanilla of the Cerrado, which is uh, more juicy than the Madagascar vanilla, uh, pimenta de macaco, among others. So the framings of this research are geographic, the Cerrado region, and socioeconomic and symbolic. Both are marked by continuities between territory and the networks that make up chains of production, distribution, and <coughs> consumption but also those that make up sociability, sensitivities, cosmologies, solidarity, and conflict. This research attempts to identify and map the cultural aspects of terroir in the Cerrado bioma, thinking about the centrality of this notion of terroir as the connection between local and global. Terroir is considered as something that, from pre-existing factors, bring together human and environmental elements, is reflected in expertise and technology, in ways of presenting themselves to the world and being recognized externally, incorporated into the value chain and reversed in development. In this process, 
the products of nature are no longer seen as simple commodities, but instead become an economic and symbolic category of increasing the additional of value. This is a perspective for thinking about terroir as an asset and for proposing sustainable development policies from there. One aspect that arises in this discussion is related to the enjoyment of rights, rights to health, dignity, citizenship, citizenship and life itself. Oh, I forgot this one. So, in October of 2017, Sao Paulo City Hall, during João Doria's administration from the PSDB party, launched the Alimento para Todos initiative, Alimento for All. According to the municipality's website, the basis of this program would be the distribution of Alimento. This is Alimento with double L. It is not the common sensual notion of food. It is a trademark. It is rather an industrial subproduct of food. Its nutritional composition is not specified anywhere. We can see the, the alimento here in this pot. So it is claimed to be, and it was quoted from the City Hall website, a nutritious powder composed of foods usually wasted by the population and that contains important nutritional properties and can be added to meals. Immediately after the launch of the initiative, several activists, health professionals, and human rights organizations took a critical stand on the proposal so that the project was suspended after the allegations over the weaknesses and contradictions of the project. What is crucial in this debate is the opposing contrasting views on social class and dignity expressed in food practices and policies. Alimento policy presented by the city government is based on a fundamental social divide in which food waste can be reprocessed and given to poor and working class families. It allows us to see separate categories of citizens, those who can eat based on their consumption patterns and those whose, whose diet can consist of what is considered unfit for consumption by other consumers. In this policy, the role of food for well-being is replaced by a disqualifying concept of poverty. Poverty here is framed by the notion of poverty as absence. Its target is not to provide human dignity, but sustaining human nutritional balance. <coughs> the production of meanings triggered in this policy focused its objective on caloric balance, on maintaining minimal standards of nutrition. In short, it restricts itself to basic functionality and discards sociability, affectivity, and other symbolic and material dimen dimensions that constitute both our humanity and provide sustainable conditions for, among other personal objectives, social mobility and personal achievement. In the normative sphere, the so-called poison bill, the draft law number 6299-2002, is a second symptomatic case. It represents the consolidation of a massive large-scale production process that has been pushing for more flexible regularization of pesticide use, changing the agrochemical nomenclature to pesticides and environmental control products. It is worth mentioning that Brazil has one of the most permissive legislation in terms of pesticide control. Only this year, the country authorized the use of more than 308 pesticides. Since 2018, a total of more than 830 chemical substances have been authorized. The poison bill puts in debate risks beyond the chemicals it proposes to release on their terminology. Such measures related to and are organized to consolidate an entire degrading chain of production, labor, and consumption. 
So it is important to say that this breaks with a 10-year-long public policy turn in Brazil. These previous policies focused on the reduction of poverty and the discussion of the meaning of food and consumption for the poor. Previous programs, such as Programa Nacional de Alimentação Escolar, the National School Food Program, and the Programa de Aquisição de Alimentos, Food Acquisition Program, connected two fundamental dimensions, the production and the supply to large logistics circuits. Both focused on implementing a food and nutritional security policy based on strengthening family farming. These policies were linked to the agrarian reform and land regularization programs under development by the now ex extinguished Ministry of Agrarian Development, the National Indian Foundation, FUNAI, and the National Institute for Colonization and Agrarian Reform, INCRA. At its peak, these were programs with, with budgets of several hundred billion reais that, in 2017, went through drastic budget cuts, that is, they became unfeasible. Brazil is often re referred to as the world leader in pesticide use, which is linked to the agribusiness-oriented agricultural production model. This model is also characterized by extreme land ownership concentration, latifundios, and uses large quantities of pesticides to allegedly ensure large-scale production. In contrast, there is a range of other production models in Brazil. These models are characterized by scale and relationship with locality. First, even if they can opt for network organizations that can reach high levels of production, ownership of the land is often based on small and middle-sized production units. Second, by local, such approach sees the territory as constitutive of production practices and the aspects of local biomes conditions in which they are located as elements of added value to what is being produced. And who are implementing these models? The Landless Workers Movement, MST, Quilombola Descendants, Comunidades Remanescentes de Quilombos, Indigenous People, migrants and migrant descendants, and small family farmers, among others. These communities develop and implement food production expertise that integrates their cultural identities and the specific biomes where they cultivate. Most of them are in, in the Cerrado region, actually all of them. In recent years, this relationship between cultural identities and specific biomes has been capitalized by some restaurant owner chefs and food entrepreneurs who launched for-profit initiatives usually linked to their own private enterprises. These entrepreneurs chefs present themselves as pathfinders, cultural mediators, and advocates of local cultures. Very often, they behave like middlemen. This mediation, performed by famous chefs, is inscribed in the register of an elite consumption based on the discovery of authentic Brazil, Brasil Profundo. This is produced as the encounter between the civilized and the unknown, often covered in mysteries, and for that reason, also embedded in fascination such as the appropriation produced by the collection of archaeological and anthropological findings in colonial settings, the civilized eye is the only one capable of prospecting the wastelands in search of the hidden gems of the taste, attributing meaning and importance, elevating the banal to the level of what the French qualify as terroir, and extracting economic value in the process. Is the access to wider publics granted to local producers? Can local communities take informed decision on the destination of their traditional producers, their images, and their own narratives? What is lost in this cultural translation made by third-party economic actors? 
the translation of complex production relations and identity that is based on the building of these terroir, encompassing the MST producing, producer, the indigenous, the quilombola descendant, and other traditional communities, leave a number of questions unanswered. Terroir, classically claimed as a local distinction, an emblem of the autonomy of traditional products in the face of globalized and mass production and consumption systems, is seen in this context as a legitimizing category of the same global consumption and production. This happens in as much as value attribution has in the rests in the hands of external agents and traditional ways of food production remain in risk of extinction caused by the pressure of large-scale agribusiness presence in several fronts, ecologically, economically, politically, in terms of regulation and increasing regulatory barriers to formal markets. As traditional modes become rare and scarce, this repositions the economic value and reshapes the public who have access to these products. At the same time, the mass economy of agribusiness food production is organized by devaluation because the large scale food is produced under the economic logic of reaching commoditization, what erases the link between the local. Food processing, in this sense, erases identity. The intention here is not to demarcate an inevitable polarization between productive circuits that favor large-scale production and local-oriented production arrangements. But here it is necessary to acknowledge that mass production supply chains may, in fact, limit the conditions of access to goods produced according to traditional methods and techniques, already conditioned by greater influence of seasonal seasonality and by correspondingly lower or zero doses of agricultural implements and pesticides. Could both production patterns coexist? That is not a no for sure, but given current political and economic conditions established in Brazil and elsewhere, several factors, as pointed above, create growing pressure to the existence of local-oriented ways of production. And what about sustainability of local-oriented production systems? Scale is not part of the problem, as many as may be demonstrated by the importance of family cultivation in the sharing of food production for internal consumption in Brazil. The, la the largest organic rice producers in Brazil are considered altogether linked to MST-based productive units. It is possible to have a place for such consumption patterns gradually associated with elite consumption based on healthier, more natural and sustainable forms of eating. In other words, it is possible to democratize all the benefits of local-oriented productions. It remains to be seen whether these conditions of access can be developed in such a way as to allow consumption, because they are always mediated by distribution and consumption channels to a wider public, or whether they will remain as products accessed as scarce goods and thus restricted and, valu restricted and valuable access, inscribed in the dimension of an elite frugality. This is the space that will be occupied by public debates about what levels of healthiness, quality, and adequacy of local habits can be preserved. Believing that only market pressures can, can be in charge of such decisions is irresponsible. Public policy and regulatory systems already play an essential role and how this will be, uh, will be mediated with and affect the population should not be segregated from public scrutiny. The argument here is that terroir can play a different role if appropriated by local communities themselves. This can shift perspectives, take the product from the banal dimension of, of local routines, recover the productive techniques from the realm of the obsolete and the archaic, and adding social meaning to otherwise peripheral dimension 
by giving these characteristics a potentially positive dimension. In conclusion, production relationships may be no longer seen as primary and outdated, but as representative of a specific way of life and sensitivities, thus meaningful. Meanings that are key to affection and fulfillment. Being affect, so expands the dimension of cooking beyond fire, connects the before, during and after. Terroir connects production and consumption, rural and urban, the local and the global. In that lies the difference between the social and dignified experience of eating as part of a social collective body and being fed for the purposes of exploitation. Thank you. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> Is anyone else speaking for me? So, um, your your model is wonderful, but the reality of Brazil today is that it's the the government's been captured by ag agribusiness with a model of export. It's a model that came before this current government, of course, under Lula and and Mousseffi, Jim Mousseffi, But really, investing heavily <coughs> in increased export of. Um, agri agri agricultural products for international markets. And even though there's a certain decline in the markets, this is still the model that's there, and I think it's being intensified, expanding production, expanding uh, access to lands uh, in order to, to do that. So what would, be, what would be the kind of government policies that would allow Tiroir to really exist? What would be the kinds of things that would be necessary to revert this process in a concrete way in Brazil? To be able to uh, favor the small producers of the MSCT and others in the in the Cerrado and, and other parts of Brazil. Thank you, Jimmy, for your question. Uh, we are going to have uh, elections in the municipalities next year, so this also can be like model public policies implemented in the municipalities in the states, and uh, well, it's a constantly constant fight actually. So. What are the concrete kinds of things you imagine that could be necessary? Is it for the city government or the state to help finance cooperatives to be more successful yeah. or to to invest much more in small small scale farming? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine what you're yeah. saying, your critique in terms of a, a real shift in, in the model, which is is yeah. it's not a, it, it's not easy, neither simple, but. Um, I think we're going, uh, let me see, they need to, first of all, they shouldn't be persecuted uh, like a social movements, as is being happening with the MST movement. Uh, other uh, public policies should be linked to these food policies, for example, uh, indigenous policies, where indigenous people are also like, uh, having to fight not only about their way of producing, but to exist in Brazil, just to exist. Uh, many policies that we have uh, in the former uh, government, they doesn't exist anymore, but they are not only suspended, they, they had their budget, their budget cuts. Um, I think it's, it's really important to have uh, policies impl implemented, but also Maybe it's hard to, to like saying what should be made by by like give recipes. But uh, one thing that I consider that is important is to listen to to those people. Like make public consultancies. They should be actors in this in the designing of this this these policies. Uh, MST is an independent movement that is designing this and close to Brasilia. Brasilia is a region that is surrounded by latifundios, by the soy production. They, they spread the pesticides with the airplanes and it affects even the organic productions. It, it, it has been a challenge for the organic producers in Brasilia. So um, I think there, 
these policies should be built basically together. We should not implement a kind of development system that should be brought and implemented, but they should be implemented from the land, from the people. Thais. Hi. Uh, we've talked before about so my name is Thais Machado. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology. I'm a visiting research fellow in Africana. So my work is around black women yeah. working in professional kitchens in Brazil, working as chefs especially. So we have a lot of things in common, the way that you're like dealing with food as um, the culinary thinking as a methodological device because it's part of what I'm thinking. But thinking about comments, um, uh, I was wondering why you are not addressing race in your work because it's it's in everything that you're talking about. Yeah. Right. So you're talking about class, poverty, quilombolas, yeah. indigenous populations, and. I think there, th this kind of uh, way of approaching it, it's kind of like an indirect way of approaching mm -hmm. the issue of race because we have um, a long history of black women working in yeah. kitchens and domestic kitchens as professionals. And I think this shows how these asymmetries that the gastronomical knowledge is in searching in this approach to the the tehoa, like the, the Brazilian cuisine. Yeah. Because I think there's a very, it's a way that is very colonized, it's a very colonizing way, a very widening way also, like it's turning these things in a specific uh, content. <coughs> so for example, like Alex Atala is doing like this work with Paulina do Cerrado that you, you showed us. And he's like receiving a lot of money to do this research. Public money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Public money and the, the, the communities that always like made possible that we have like Paulina do Cerrado and Tube today. They're receiving like 10%, I think. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of like, I was writing it down like, how this Dutch chef in Brasilia is doing this Babette feast, and he's the ambassador. Like, I was writing down all the words that you're using, and I was like thinking that maybe understanding that the gastronomy has a racialized lexic of working, and it's yeah. white and it's European, would help you a lot to understand this asymmetries. I don't know if you're doing that. But no, I am, and you're completely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're completely right. Uh, I am doing this. Uh, this vanilla, this, well, I don't know if everybody heard about it, but there is a project with the vanilla do Cerrado at the Calunga uh, Quilombo, close to Brasilia. Thais can help me. And there is a very famous Brazilian chef who started to teach these traditional communities how to cultivate the vanilla of Cerrado because it's wild. They usually go to, to the wild to extract the vanilla. And uh, he, he answered to a call. He, he used public money to implement this project. And then he got very famous and he didn't uh, like gave almost any feedback and he didn't share the profits. And he also, I think, he he, uh, he he registered the name of Vanilla do Cerrado uh, in the intellectual property yeah. in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. it's not a yeah, he, he's with the indigenous population. No, he didn't Amazon. register the yeah, but, he, they, but they, he's like always doing this work with communities. Yeah, yeah. Like he was the one. Knowledge. His name is Alex Atala. He was the one on the, and and also, for example, I, I don't know if you could uh, re read, but there was another woman, Bella Gil, which, which uh, they are always in between. 
they do something that seems to be good for these communities, but then the but she's we don't. She, she, she was involved, like, and she here was saying that oh, uh, the Calungas, the population, they don't know the value of the vanilla de cerrado. But now we are teaching them. We are we are teaching them how to cultivate this. So uh, there is a matter of techniques that should be recognized, should be valued, should be, there's a matter of um, agency. Né? Uh, th there is, and of, of course, as a total social fact, we can, race is here, gender is here as well, because most of the time women are the ones who process the product. And black women. Yeah, especially uh, the, I don't know if I answer, but we can keep talking about this later. So um, one, one of the things that I, I think that we have in the United States that's similar to your system in Brazil is the fact that um, when these areas were colonized by Europeans, there was an incredible amount of open space in ways that other modern nations don't have. So. Um, industrialized agriculture had a really easy time expanding into the Amazon, expanding into the Great Plains in our two nations. So land access in both Brazil and the United States is a really critical component for small farmers, both for our, our immigrant farmers here in the United States and for young people who cannot afford land. And I, I wonder if there, if you can speak to um, whether there are any initiatives to address this issue and to make sure that that land remains avail available for indigenous communities in these areas so that they can farm and grow food if they want to. Uh, we had those politicals, they're being like destroyed right now because indigenous people, they had their land demarcated, but not all the land. It's, it's already in process in Brazil. Everything is in risk right now. Uh, I think they are facing a, a higher risk than in the other uh, periods of time. Uh, also, this, this latifundio model, I think it is important to say, it, well, it, uh, it is an authoritarian model, not only because of the standardization of the production, but in the 60s, the 70s, uh, during the authoritarian regime in Brazil, uh, we had this, what was called the Green Revolution. And it was not the Professor Green Revolution, unfortunately, <laughs> but... <laughs> but uh, these huge extensions of, of land started to, to receive a lot of uh, benefits to, to cultivate soy, corn, uh, and like they are, these extensions became like green, but they are full of pesticides. And in that time, and, and the dictator regime has a lot to do with these expansions. Um, right now, the use of the pesticides, who, who grows using pesticides? There is a, what we call a, a bancada ruralista. I don't know how to the rural lobby in Brazil, and they are, well, they are making the loss that benefits themselves all the time. And we don't have a, a, a strong lobby for those communities, for, for those traditional methods. So it's been a huge challenge, actually. They don't receive, like, the, it's very expensive to, to sell their products, although we have, like, uh, uh, farmers market, but they are, it's, it's not easy to find organics in Brazil like we have here. The, the channels of production, they are not very well linked with the distribution and the consumption as well. Any other questions? <coughs> I, I don't know if we have time, but Yeah, we have time. I was wondering whether, because in, in, uh, in, in France, uh, the word like the label terroir is very much connected to a feeling of pride yeah. and to the, to the history of the, of, 
terre, right, to the, of, the, of the land. <coughs> and um, so during your field work, uh, how do you, how that the, the local communities, or in the future maybe, do you think local communities in Brazil will actually um, somehow understand the use of this label that maybe you will have to translate at a certain point in Portuguese? Because I feel also the relationship between, in terms of nature and culture, right, from a European perspective and then uh, a, a Latin American yeah. perspective is not the same. So terre, terroir, nature, culture, the, the paradigms are completely different. Do you think that they will be as aware or as proud of this dignity that you want to emphasize of these products as maybe this happens? Because um, even in Europe, yeah, I think no. that it's not the same terroir in, 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 in France than, let's say, in Germany or in Italy, because the relationship to the land is all the time different. Okay. Thank you, Erica. You know, uh, during since the beginning, I started to think about if I should or should not use the, the word terroir, because it seems to be colonized as well. So... It doesn't have a translation, an exactly translation. So I, I, I think the, the, what is important, well, here to like explain what I'm thinking in this specific space, I'm, I'm using it, but I'm, I'm still looking for something else. But I think what is the most important is uh, the, the the know-how, how to implement this, how to build this connection, how to, to organize all this chain through dignity, through reconhecimento, uh, I forgot. With acknowledgement, uh, with acknowledgement thank you. And uh, how to build this link between methods, identity, dignity, citizenship, which also, when I was starting to, to research about this word, there is another word in French that is called climat, which is really, well, I'm, I'm not discuss this right now, but they have both. And it, terroir actually is, is from the medieval, yeah, era, so, I don't know. Um, I don't know if this is within the, the scope of your research, but I imagine it intersects, so, Three years ago, I was doing some research on um, classification of, of quilombo uh, communities in, um, in present-day Brazil, especially in, um, in urban areas, and there are uh, communities that have already been officially classified, and many more that are in the un, un, you know, unending waiting list um, to, to be officially classified. Um, and I think that there's an interesting issue within the classification process for Quilombs, and I don't know how it's changed over the past three years, if it has changed officially, you know, I think with what's going on in Brazil, everything must be up in the air. But one of the criteria for classification is that these communities have to demonstrate, in most cases, traditional patterns of land use um, and cultivation, and I'm wondering how that feeds into your research, because um, I think that can be a positive and empowering thing for some communities, but for other communities that are seeking this type of classification, um, it can be a straight jacket that, that doesn't correspond to their reality because um, they don't have that, they don't uh, own any land, they don't mm -hmm. seek to own and cultivate land in that way because of the urban um, environments that they're situated in. So. I don't know if you could speak to that at all. I will try. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I understood. Uh, well, most of the part, uh, I will talk about the Kalunga community in the close to Brasilia, close mm -hmm. to the federal district. They are in the Chapada dos Veadeiros region. But uh, I think it's not about implementing a model of cultivation, but it's also, it's to recognize what already exists, the model that is already there. It's not about to change anything because, for example, when Thais uh, spoke about the Vanilla do Cerrado, there was a, some chefs was trying to teach them 
how to cultivate something that they already had a relationship with for um, commercial uh, purpose. But this is not about changing anything. It's about like, it's about autonomy, it's about agency. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if that's for, for some specific communities that have, you know, the quote unquote traditional land use patterns as part of that identity, if, you know, what the, the type of project that you envision could be combined with, um, you know, the, the, the process that they have to go through to get recognized as, as Kilome yeah, communities, maybe. if that would feed into it. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's good. Probably. Thank you. Maria. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes the culture they might have is not necessarily yeah. uh, local or in tune with the local uh, yeah. culture. So. Uh, close to Brasilia, there is a, a important community of <coughs> Japanese people who grow like fruit. There is also um, people from Switzerland who started to make cheese, but with local milk and trying to using their techniques to, to deal with the pro local products and also there are uh, internal migrants too because uh, Brasilia is a relatively new uh, city so there is a, a important a contingent of people who came from other states from Brazil and started to to work and to cultivate in the surroundings of Brasilia I don't know. And the knowledge is too different from, no, from that of local communities. And cannot it be in conflict with local uh, knowledge and local agricultural methods? I don't think they're in conflict. I think they're different. But, and, and they just live together. We have like a lot of uh, uh, farmers market in, in the surroundings of Brasilia and in the closed cities like Piranópolis is one of them. And people exchange. Sometimes if you go to, I, I was making a field research with a woman who makes wine. In, so she was the first, oh, she decided to grow grapes and make wine there. And then she opened a, uh, a small restaurant. And in, in her restaurant, she started to, to be visited by these different communities. And they like exchange. They show their products. Th there is this trade there that is, exp it is expressive. It is important. It is also important for, for the local economies. And I think it's, it works well there. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.